welcome Michael Williams, the amazing Michael Williams is with us today. Welcome to the 30 day challenge. Michael is the author of the pro 90 D smooth speech system. He was a stutterer. Michael has experienced every single speech disfluency that he coaches for from blocking to speaking too fast to unconditional movements. Tens of thousands of people have benefited from his training program and have learned to speak smoothly and communicate confidently to pursue their dreams. Welcome, Michael Williams. Thank you, Guy. I appreciate you having me here. It's such a pleasure. It's such a pleasure. May I ask you, why did you decide to focus your life's work on working with people who stutter or struggle with their speech? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I have always been interested in helping people achieve their goals. It really came about because I wanted to do something that I would be passionate about um, and something that would help transform the lives of others. And, and it just so happened that it was helping people with their speech. Excellent. Uh, I guess I want to ask you the big question because uh, there are many opinions out there. And it's all over the place. And the question is, is stuttering a neurological, psychological, and or socialized, uh, sociological disorder? Is stuttering a disorder, a disability? Is it permanent? What have you discovered in working with so many people over the years? What are your observations for yourself and with working with others? What have you found? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not a scientist, but the answer to your question is yes <laughs> to all of those things. Um, sometimes it's one thing, sometimes it's multiple things. So from working with the thousands, I'd say probably tens of thousands of people um, and all the research out there, you know, there are people who stuttered as a child, right, growing up. We know that stuttering is a, a somewhat normal developmental part or process that people go through, right? Uh, a certain percentage of people go through a period of stuttering when they're growing up. And most of those people outgrow it, but some don't. It sticks with them. And as a person gets older, if they've struggled with stuttering or stammering, it then becomes a part of their identity. So they start to identify themselves as a, so now it's not just physical or physiological, it's also psychological because now they begin to anticipate, they think of themselves, they see themselves as a person who stutters. Now to back up a bit, I think a lot of the research would show that for the most part, whether it's social, psychological, hereditary, because there are lots of people who are stuttering runs in their family. I've seen this for myself. Um, there are people who picked up stuttering from family members. I've seen this. I've seen people who said, I never stuttered until I started to hang out with my uncle. <laughs> and then one person said, I was mimicking my uncle. I didn't stutter, but I was mocking, mimicking my uncle. And then I started to stutter. So I've, I've seen, I've heard all of that. Is it neurological? Well, yes. Basically, everything is neurological. It starts with our brain. Um, so there's some people that says that there's a, a neural transmitter that when you have too much of it, this can trigger or cause stuttering. If you have too little of it, this can trigger or cause stuttering. Um, so is it neurological? Well, yes. Is it psychological? Uh, for many people, it's become psychological. It's become a part of their identity. And that's why we have a holistic system that addresses not just the physical part, physiological aspects of speech, but also the psychological aspects, which become so much more ingrained the older the person gets. So uh, the other question is, um, how do we how do we know that people barring certain types of severe brain injuries? or degenerative diseases uh, can not only speak well, but also become excellent 
speakers. What have you found out? I mean, uh, are we all doomed to uh, uh, stuttering forever and I am defined by this? Uh, you've worked with so many people and experimented, ran so many different experiments. What have you found out? Can you give us some hope? Yeah, I'm actually working on a, a new series right now. And the title of it is, Is There Hope? <laughs> and so, and I just recorded the first video yesterday. So, yes, there is hope. Uh, I've only, again, barring brain damage, I would say the vast majority, almost anyone who stutters, it doesn't matter if it's severe or mild or situational, almost anyone who stutters can change their speech pattern. They can change the way that they speak, which meaning they can learn to speak smoothly. They can change their thinking and their beliefs, their mindset. So they can learn to stop fearing speech, stop anticipating stuttering. So they can change their beliefs about themselves. They can change their speech. And the reason that this is true is because of uh, neuroplasticity, that we have the ability through our own efforts to literally change, to rewire our brains, right? We have that ability. The thing that stops people, for the most part, is, is an ingrained or a deep-seated belief that they can't do it, that it's just not going to work. So, the handful of people who I've seen who this hasn't worked for, it's not because it couldn't work or that it wasn't working, it's that they didn't believe that it was going to work. So their beliefs. Uh, so yes, almost any, I mean, I've worked with people who I literally had to coach them in the initial interview. In fact, it was a, a lady, she's a, a veterinarian. And I forget which country she was from. I had to coach her in the interview with some techniques so we could make it through the interview. So she was super, super severe. Like, and so we got her speaking a little bit smoother in the interview. And she's going on to, uh, to be a pretty smooth speaker. So I've worked with people who are super severe all the way up to people who you wouldn't even know that they stuttered. And again, there's been a handful of people who just quit dropped out that does happen but that's only because they just really didn't believe and didn't want to put in the effort because it takes a lot of effort to change the way you speak and the way you think uh i have i've listened to some speech pathologists talk uh, uh a, a very uh in a very opinionated way uh often mm. saying that um uh you're suffering from a neurological disorder which is what isn't neurological? First of all, uh, what is stage fright? Is a neurologic is a neurological experience. Uh, positive thinking is a neurological. Uh, so it really doesn't describe much. Uh, and they will say, um, "Look, you have a brain communication issue." Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I would ask, "Oh, really? Well, what is that?" Um, mm -hmm. And I'll, they'll say, "And I'll uh, and I'll say, why do stutterers?" often who you'll see that are famous can sing beautifully and yet mm -hmm. they stutter horribly and they mm -hmm. will say it's because one side of the brain uh uses one side of your brain for singing and use the other side of your brain for talking uh what they're inferring or an individual is inferring by saying that <clears throat> is that there is a brain uh wiring or a brain communication issue from the brain to the vocal cords to create a uh, an obedient uh, response and so that that errs on the side of hey stuttering is a permanent uh, disability you have a disability yet in the face of that millions of stutterers outgrow or walk away from stuttering every year not just walking mm -hmm. away like from a spontaneous remission standpoint but they're walking, describing their process. One day I demanded that I stop stuttering. I took responsibility for my life and my personal expression, my own mm -hmm. life fluency. 
as it were. Mm -hmm. Fluency, my ability to communicate with others. I stopped repressing my speech and I started and I faced my fears and I yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> so what can you shed, a, shed some light on us on on one hand? Why do some people in a certain uh, educational um, community promote mm -hmm. the the the, the uh, belief for mm -hmm. all I can say is it must be a belief uh, for in the face of people walking away from it or demanding not to stutter. Not to stutter. So how do you explain how we have uh, what really is going on when we have mm -hmm. a group of educators who say that you have a permanent disability? And then we have, on the other hand, uh, millions of people walking away. And I'll hear uh, famous people who say they spoke hor they stuttered horribly, Bruce Willis and uh, Ed Sheeran and all these people. And one day, and they describe their process, often on their own, they mm -hmm. found a way out. They've moved mm -hmm. into their expression. Can you shed some yeah. light on that? What are your thoughts on that? Well, so traditional speech therapists and traditional speech therapy have a, a belief, if you will, that they've been taught. So it's it's an educational belief, an educational slant that says uh, this is why people stutter. Stuttering is just one speech disorder, if you want to call it that, right? And they say, well, this is what happens and this is why it happens. And I've had many, many clients who've gone to speech therapists who I'm not talking bad about speech therapists because I often refer children and so forth, but they'll say my speech therapist told me you'll never be a great speaker. You're just kind of stuck with this. And that's what they said, okay. And so we can just help you, you know, maybe get up to the place where you can say your name and where you can be, but, but, but don't, don't try to go out and become a public speaker. So this is what they were taught. Well, I started with the premise because I kind of stumbled upon this. I said, wait a minute. I started my whole life. And all of a sudden, when I model Brian Tracy or Charles Stanley, that is when I pretend to be someone else or speak differently, I'm 100% fluent. Not only that, I speak very well. So how is that possible? And so as I began to go further and deeper into modeling, and then I began to research uh, observational learning and habit formation and skill development, I said, guess what? Yes, this might be permanent, right? This might be something hereditary. It might be something that's, and probably is and is neurological, but that doesn't matter. Right? Even people who've had strokes have been able to do what I call in my video, uh, recruit other areas of the brain to help them to speak well. They've been able to grow new uh, n neuronal connections. And so, so I said, hey, guess what? Whether this is permanent or not, doesn't matter what the source is or what the cause is. None of that really matters. The only thing that matters is that we have the ability to change our brains, right? We have the, our brains have the ability to recruit other areas of our brain to recruit, meaning to come in and say, hey, we have this problem with fluency. <clears throat> we need you to come in and help us with this, right? We need this part of the brain to come over and help us so that we can speak more fluently. So going and operating off of that premise that through our own actions and through our own thoughts, we could develop a new pattern because speaking is, is a pattern, it's, it's an action, it's a behavior, something that we do. It also involves our thoughts. We can develop a new pattern of speaking and we can develop a new pattern of thinking. So based off of that, I was able to create the system and it gives people hope because it doesn't matter what the source is. It doesn't matter if it's a disability or a disorder. You can still replace it with excellent speech and with confident, calm thinking. Excellent. So origin is irrelevant. I've heard, exactly. I have spoken to many stutterers and it's all over the place. It, uh, how long have you been stuttering? 18 years. Uh, what is the origin? Uh, my parents fought when I was a child, when I was three, they were getting a divorce and they fought. Another says, uh, my father told me to shut up. 
Another one says, my mother told me that I had a very unattractive voice. Uh, so a fright, uh, mm -hmm. um, an illness, um, mm -hmm. a, 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 an outside force, uh, parents, uh, so-and-so, belief systems, origins, beginning. So we talk about neuroplasticity. We talk mm -hmm. about neuroplasticity as a remapping. It sounds fancy, but isn't it actually like, aren't we working our neuroplasticity when we learn how to dance or to sing mm -hmm. or to drive a car? Are we going from perhaps from absolute ignorance to learning a new skill? Uh, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. Essentially, we're... We're doing two things. So what Pro90D does is it looks at speech like a habit, a pattern, and a skill. Why do you think there are so many schools and classes and workshops for public speaking to learn to communicate better? Because communicating well is a skill. It's a, it's a learnable habit. It's something that you can learn how to do better. It's also a habit. We have certain patterns, ways of speaking, speaking too fast or mumbling, whatever. And so if you look at it like that, wow, I can create through the, the natural process of neuroplasticity. I can create a new pattern, a new way of speaking. And on top of that, I can enhance the way that I speak because it's a skill. I can learn to articulate. Technically, it's enunciate. I can enunciate better. I like to use the word articulate. I can articulate. I can have better body language. I can learn to modulate my voice and flex. Uh, I can learn to do, I can learn to change the cadence of my speech. I like to call it rhythm, right? So that I can speak more dynamically. So all of these things are learnable skills. And what we do in Pro 90 d and this may be something that you ask me later, but is we shift the focus away from how do I stop stuttering, how do I avoid blocking, to how can I speak well? How can I speak smooth? How can I become an excellent speaker? So by shifting the focus away, we no longer really concerned or worried about the source. We're no longer worried about stuttering, blocking, treating it. No, we just simply focus on how we want to speak and we... Um, do all the things necessary to speak that way. This is outstanding. So speech becomes speech becomes a skill. So uh, I'll throw a ball in the air and see if this uh, throw something at the wall, see if it sticks. <laughs> ignorance, the concept of vocal ignorance. Uh, example: No one taught us how to walk. We we rolled around on the bed as children. We crawled around on the floor and we tried to get up and we fell down. We invented it. We invented it. Uh, what about uh, speech? No one taught us how to talk. Is it possible that a child can guess wrong uh, and create a severe bad habit that can appear like a neurological disorder when in actuality, their the vocal mechanics and whatnot are failing them left, right, and center. They can't get the words out because of the way that they're perhaps approaching uh, speaking. How does P90 approach that? What are your thoughts on on working with all these people, seeing all these different effects and uh, ticks and all these things? I've seen singers when they try to hit high note. I watch them go. Yeah interference vocal interference might we be seeing uh, all these assists and things they look electrical but in effect may they be a muscular engagement in attempt to get the word out what are your thoughts yeah i think that people have learned and this is not a scientific explanation this is just my opinion over the years from from my own personal experience and seeing thousands and thousands of people. So it really is my opinion. What I've, I've learned is that people learn different ways to get the words out. They learn coping mechanisms to get the words out. And so perhaps from a child, they learn to do different things because they weren't able to get the words out. 
sometimes children uh, they speak too fast or maybe they actually stuttered um, and a part of it could have been that they just felt anxious they spoke too fast and no one ever slowed them down so it's just relax take your time slow down that's just one aspect of this right and so what happened is they just kept speaking too fast and then they they kept pushing out words by making facial movements or facial expressions or tapping you see people who tap or their lips would quiver that would happen to me sometimes so these are things that would happen physically that became a pattern right that they felt like was out of their control uncontrollable i can't control this well i know it's controllable because when i see someone doing that one of the first things that we do is we say you have to disconnect that is you have to as soon as you feel that you're about to do it or as soon as you do it you have to stop i said well, how can i stop i could stop i would have stopped a long time ago no but once you know that you can like stop that you can stop doing that right with your own thoughts and your own intention okay i'm not going to push this word out then they find it wow i actually am able to stop doing these ticks or movements that I actually do have greater control so to answer your question yeah i think a lot of these things are coping mechanisms they're things that people have learned over the years and then it and then they feel like it's out of their control because they just do it automatically i think you're an expert though you're more of an expert in, in terms of um, voice coaching so you might be able to speak to this a little more than i can but that's just my experience uh so we talk about um there's this term a bad habit so in your opinion uh a bad habit we could say it's a choice how does a choice how does a child I've been, let's say I've been stuttering for 18 years. Let's say I started when I was eight years old. I started stuttering, stammering. Uh, and it's an unconscious choice. I'm having this experience as a child. Uh, I'm trying to get the words out. Mm -hmm. uh, when and how does a poor choice, maybe the incorrect choice, perhaps you're trying to voice a voiceless consonant, for those of you who don't know what a voiceless consonant is, a is a click, pop, or an air puff coming out of your mouth. And you're trying to, to project that into a room, not knowing that it cannot be voiced. And so this becomes, so when does a poor choice become an automated habit? Like, why is it possible where a person, why do you think it's possible that a person can go from, I have no choice in the matter, it just something happens like mm -hmm. I may not think that this act is actually an activity in an attempt to get the words out. This actually is not an electrical choice, but it happens so quickly from perhaps a, uh, an engagement style that I introduced when I was eight and a half years old. And mm -hmm. so every time I try to speak, everyone can witness this engagement will take place. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on uh, ingrainment habits, the automaticness of things, and can they, can they be altered? Can they be changed? So one thing that I want to make clear is, uh, is I'm not saying that the stuttering didn't start as something that it that it, that it start that it started as a habit. So for sure, when children are growing up, again, we we've, we've said that it can be a a part of the developmental process. They didn't choose to not be able to get the words because I can remember back in second grade, I just couldn't get the words out. It wasn't a habit that I developed. <laughs> it just happened to me, right? Now, in saying that, though you you reach a a point or you reach a stage where you do what you just said you start to do different things to get the words out and those <clears throat> while they may be unconscious those are habits like pushing out words doing certain things with their mouth and face uh, those are so the source of it that like whatever's happening neurological 
wasn't a ha- it wasn't a choice, right? But what we do to get the words out that that is a choice, and so it doesn't mean that the person who's struggling with this chose to do it. They chose I chose to stutter. But what we are saying is that uh, some of the facial expressions and the tics are things that we can stop, we can change, and <clears throat> not only that, we can overwrite, we can create a new habit or a new pattern so that we actually don't stutter anymore, right? So I just wanted to make sure that that, that was clear from my side based on your question. Sure, I didn't sure, want people to, sure. I, I completely like, understand. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't want people to watch this and go, well, Michael Williams is saying that it's, that it was a choice that I, that I chose as a kid to stutter. No, I'm not saying that. But some of the facial expressions and other things that people do um, that maybe you didn't choose to do it at the time, but you can choose to to stop those things now. Excellent. So I guess what, to clarify, I didn't want to leave the impression mm-hmm. that I'm saying that a child chooses to stutter. Uh, what I'm inferring is mm-hmm. that we attempt to engage in an activity, mm-hmm. be it be it dancing, speech, singing, whatever it is, swinging a golf club. We attempt an activity. I'm a, I'm on the golf course. I want to hit that ball. Uh, up mm-hmm. So that's my intention. I want to get this ball, let's say golf, up to into that the flag down there that's 200 yards away. I want to get it there. Mm-hmm. So the objective is to do something. And my point mm-hmm. being that we're trying in innocence. Mm-hmm. A child is trying to get the words out, and the words mm-hmm. aren't coming out. Mm-hmm. What I'm inferring right. is that what can appear to a, a anyone on the street as a an electrical brain to nerve mm-hmm. nerves to musculature engagement as mm-hmm. something that is it is out of the person's control from the standpoint of if it's a if if something becomes habituated right whether it's so right. the point is does this have to happen you right. yourself said, uh, I observed some version of a secondary occurring, and I chose mm-hmm. for it not to happen anymore. I asked the question. Mm-hmm. You probably mm-hmm. did. Is this required? Or <laughs> am right. I trying? Is this, is this the best guess of a nine-year-old child trying to get a word out, which, exactly. never cha- which I've never changed? So people, I'm trying, I, I want to make it very yeah. clear. I'm talking, yeah. about, I'm, I'm talking about a desire for an outcome getting Mm -hmm. not occurring and we're just struggling to get it out and so many of these things that we see people do uh, 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 all these ticks and things these Mm -hmm. what what are referred to as secondaries are actual actually embodied habits Mm -hmm. that would bring people that would bring people a lot of hope if you agree with me on that in your observation now you know, again, barring mm. brain damage, I had a stroke, a blood clot mm. to the brain. That's a wiring communication issue. Mm. But what I would like to convey to people is that we can engage in our attempt, our objective from youth, mm-hmm. being under tremendous anxiety uh, and trying to get my words out that I mm-hmm. experience uh, this jam. And so they come to work with you, and all of a sudden you bring to their awareness. Do you do you are you seeing what's happening here? Mm-hmm. Is that required, or is that a um, is that a habit? And the mm-hmm. question is, and can we drop it if it's yeah. not supporting us? So please shed exactly. some light on on hopefulness in the area of of learning yeah. new skills. You know, the, you know there's I, the confusion there. There's a confusion of what's doable and what isn't. <laughs> I can't really articulate it any better than what you just did. <laughs> so, so I agree with you wholeheartedly, 100%. I mean, you, you described it uh, perfectly <laughs> that, yes, it is something that more than likely has been brought forward that has become a habit. And when something is habituated, when it becomes a habit, it becomes automatic Mm -hmm. so you don't think about it anymore it just happens so it feels like it's out of your control but the truth is by becoming aware you use that word awareness bringing it to their awareness they become aware of what they're doing uh, while they're doing it and then often even before they do it they become aware and 
out of that awareness, they're now able to choose a different behavior, a new behavior, a better, more supportive behavior. That is absolutely true. I mean, I've I've done it. I do it. And I've seen people. Do, now, I'm not saying 100 percent of people who started it. This is the case. I can't say that. What I can say is of the tens of thousands and thousands and thousands of people that I've worked with, this is true. This is mm -hmm. true. And even you can do your own research. People who have uh, who've had strokes. Why do you think they go to speech therapists? Why do you think many of them recover? Because, you know, through through through, through training and repatterning, the person can learn to speak well through neurogenesis, through neuroplasticity, by recruiting other areas of the brain that aren't damaged, even they can learn to speak smoothly. So even with damage. So let me get this straight, because this is a this is a lightning bolt, people. See, we're not talking about hearsay. We're not talking about a man who read someone else's book. We're talking about he will humbly say that he's not a uh, a scientist. I will tell you in full fact, he absolutely is. For he is attempting to find consistencies and similarities and create bridges. And he's trying to create solutions. He asks the question, what it, does it take for you as an individual to speak smoothly? He's in a state of inquiry, which is a state of invention. And he's creating new pathways and new ways to do things. You said something amazing to me because, see, I'm not, I'm not a medical uh, person who has dealt with, hey, I had a stroke and I can't speak uh, smoothly. But what you just described to me, and give me a little rope here because I'm trying to wrap mm -hmm. my head around it. Mm -hmm. If I have a stroke and I am now, this is now my, what I'm doing in an attempt to get the words out. Mm -hmm. If I never knew how to speak, like I never knew how to walk. If I get in a car accident, let's use let's use something that I uh, that I have a minute sense of. Let's say I get in a car accident and I get some kind of spinal injury, and I can't walk. I can't move my legs. But is it that I can't move my legs, or I don't know how to move my legs? And so this man or woman walks in, hi, I'm a physical therapist, and I'm going to drag you across these balancing bars, and we're going to get you, we're going to put, we're going to start gently with putting weight on your legs, and you're going to try and support your weight, and we're on these balancing bars so you don't fall down. I'm going to educate you in how to use your legs, how they work, which you may have mm -hmm. never learned to do. And so I want to know if that's, if that's his, if that is, uh, if that is happening in the world where a person can have a stroke or, or, uh, yeah, let's say they have a stroke, they have a, they have brain damage and the neural pathway is interrupted. The, this, this way of doing something, they don't have access to it, mm -hmm. that they can actually train with someone and acquire at least a certain amount, if not all of the access to their laryngeal capacity, pressurization mm -hmm. of air, um, creating vibration at the vocal cords, directing the sound up into uh, the nasal sinus cavity for amplification, pressurization for amplification, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, vowel honoring so that the vocal cords are vibrating and the words are coming out. So it's not a black and white situation where I've had right. a stroke. I will never be able to speak again. I have to write it on a piece of paper. Is that right. true? So that's not yeah, true, it's, what I'm thinking? It's, it's forever. Exactly. I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are some people who have strokes and they never regain the capacity to speak well, or they never regain full use of one side of their body. Of course, that happens, right? If, if the damage is so severe to those areas of their brain. But for many people who have strokes, we know that, okay, so the blood flow was cut off to these areas of the brain, which caused them to not be able to speak and so forth. But through therapy, 
they're able to regenerate those neuronal connections. They're able to relearn how to speak and or the brain will, it's a word called recruitment, it will go out and recruit other areas to help it. So if an area is so damaged that simply isn't working anymore, the brain is able to say, I'm going to go to this area. And while usually we don't use you to speak, we're going to recruit you, bring you in to help us to speak. And so people who've, stro- who've, uh, who've had strokes or other brain injuries are able to recover and often speak very well. And this is almost the norm, if you will. <clears throat> so based on that, if a person who stutters, yes. You, Again, it doesn't matter if there's something wrong neurologically, our brains are capable of recruiting, our brains are capable of creating new <clears throat> neural pathways, new networks to help us speak well. This is very exciting. I'm all about the, the bringing hope to people because I want people to become leaders and I want them to think for themselves, to think outside of the box. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I uh, Unfortunately, many people, I must speak plainly, who I've spoken to, who have met with the expert, someone who has a degree hanging on their wall, who said to them, when they were children, when they were six, and to their parents or whatever, you will, you are defined by your stutter. You will never speak smoothly. Your mm-hmm. best bet is just to simply embrace the fact that you will be engaged in this activity for the rest of your life. And I want people to know, uh, have you experienced, is there hope? Have you experienced and seen that this is, does not hold up to the light of day, even though it may be a possibility in the rare case. Um, but speaking for the majority, we don't need to be so cautionary that we're, we're going to, we must uh, honor the reality of a very small percentage of stutterers who will never uh, attain smooth speech. We must speak for those who are stuttering, who wish to break free of this. Yeah. What is your experience, Ben, in the face of that? How many people work with you who are just amazingly, astoundingly blocked? And are you able to guide them uh, across the bridge to a new reality? Can you shed some light, share some light on that, please? Yeah, so a lot of this starts with with hope, right, which is what you're bringing to people. Again, I'm I'm doing a series on this very thing, and it really starts with the hope that it's possible that I can not only not stutter, but I can speak well. Once a person has hope, there's an area of our brain called the reticular cortex, the reticular activating system, if you will, It's kind of like it's antennas go up and says, so if you have the hope that you can speak well, our reticular cortex then begins to look for it, begins to actually see and filter in all the resources that we need to help us to speak well. And and so you start to actually believe, to have the confidence that, wow, I can do something about this. So that's a requirement for people who come to me. They have to believe that it's possible. Once you believe it's possible, you will do everything that you need to do to create those new patterns, to change the mindset. And some people have a greater drive than other people. Um, Some people are willing to put in the work and be consistent. And some people are not, unfortunately, because you and I know it takes a huge amount of effort to change habits or create new habits it takes a lot of effort and some people just they're just they just don't want to do it because it's it's exhausting right it's exhausting but it can be done and it's not and it doesn't take that long i see people i have videos of people who come to me and one week later if they if they focus on the one or two things that i have them focus on one week later their speech is 80 percent smoother and then you go two or three weeks and again it's up and well up into the 80s right and they might have been severe so is it possible yes it's possible and yes it can happen relatively quickly but for that to be automated now that's going to take uh, 
months. Now let's talk the truth. Michael, how do we get it in the bones? I've heard this statement over and over again. Oh, you know, train. I worked with a guy and I got this training and, you know, it's all BS, man, because my stuttering came back. It just came back. Mm. I just, you know, mm. yeah, sure. In the comfort of his office, I was able to speak smoothly and beautifully. But then I get out in the world and I'm stuttering mm. left, right and center. I guess we mm -hmm. should go. We should talk about um, the dirty word here because the dirty word might be. Am I a stutterer? Am I suffering from stuttering? Or am I suffering from anxiety? Mm. What are your thoughts, Michael? Many people, um, many transformational mm. trainers say that. Uh, say that uh, you, it's, you don't have a stuttering problem. Your stutter is a result of an underlying condition, which mm. is anxiety, social okay. distrust fear and anxiety, uh, self-perpetuated fear and anxiety. You're actually manufacturing mm -hmm. your own anxiety by seeking out the devils in the room, habituated negativity. And so you experience what you're looking for. You're looking for the devils. You find the devils. You feel, uh, you look for the bad, wrong, and incorrect, and you feel bad, wrong, and incorrect. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do I have a stuttering problem or... Obviously, I have a stuttering problem, obviously, because I'm stuttering. But if we look at it, should I attack the stutter as the as mm -hmm. the source of my suffering? Or might something mm -hmm. else be going on? Because I'll just I'll leave you the ball, but I want to bring something that um, mm -hmm. many licensed individuals fail to bring into the conversation early enough, mm -hmm. which is uh, social avoidance and stage fright and these characteristics, which are across the board experienced by stutterers. So yeah. what is your experience? Ben? Wow. I've, I've got a lot to say about that. Let me try to, let me try to be as concise as I possibly can. So I have worked with people and you probably have to where they, they didn't stutter when they were very, very young, maybe, or maybe they did, but they had an experience maybe in class where they were so anxious, so nervous that they started to stutter. And ever since that experience, they every time they got up in front of class, every time they had to do public speaking, they stuttered. And then they began to identify themselves as a person who stuttered. So it came from that experience, which is quite normal for us to experience anxiousness or nervousness, right? And it's quite normal for people who who don't usually stutter to actually stutter when they're nervous. Interviews, speaking, right? It happens. It happens all the time. And But what doesn't happen to them necessarily is they don't necessarily take that behavior into the rest of their life. This has happened and does happen to people who stutter. So, yeah, yeah sometimes it can be an experience that triggered stuttering and then they it became a part of their identity sometimes it's not that the person fears public speaking or that they have social anxiety but they develop that because they have a fear of stuttering right so the fear is that i will stutter and so therefore i'm going to be more reserved i'm not going to go out as much i'm not going to get on stage because it's not that they're the kind of person who's oh no i don't want to get on stage. I've worked with people who would love to get on stage, but they have a fear of stuttering. So it can happen that way, where it's not a fear of public speaking, it's a fear of stuttering. Now, you sent, you mentioned something else uh, in, in your earlier comments within this question. So when I was in his office or her office, I was able to speak smoothly, and then all of a sudden I went out and it's, it's, everything just went out the window. Well. One of the, the beauties of Pro 90D is that I work from you, I work with you wherever you are, meaning you, you and I will work via Zoom and I will send you back out into your, your normal life to do the things that you usually do so that you can learn to develop this new, your new speaking identity and your new speaking style within your your daily or normal life with the daily normal pressures that you have. So you will learn, <clears throat> you'll create this new identity, this new speaking pattern at your job, 
with your family, wherever it is that you go. You also learn to desensitize yourself. Very important word. So it's not like you practice this stuff at home and then you go out and you throw it out there on the world and expect it to work. No, it's like learning a new language. I'll say, okay, here's what I want you to practice in private. But what's in, but the way that this will work is that you also have to go out and practice in public. I mean, you have to make those calls. You have to talk to people. You have to do this for it to work. And when you try to do it, initially, it probably won't work. But that's a part of the process, like learning a new language. Excellent. So can we if what people often call what are your thoughts on this is what people call stuttering, not just one thing, but a composite of a variety of different things that are stacked. Here's an example. If I want to, I want to play, I have a dream of playing the guitar in front of an audience. So mm -hmm. in the privacy of my home, I'm, these are low stakes situations. I'm not being right. judged. I am not under, I am not being evaluated. It's just right. me at home. And I'm going through my chord progression and my chord progression and my chord cycle. And I'm going through mm -hmm. the song and I'm doing it and I'm doing it and I'm doing it. I do it very well. And then, but I've never been in, played in front of an audience before. Mm -hmm. And then I must face another technology, which is high stakes social situations mm -hmm. where I'm going to be judged and evaluated. So right. to it is normal and natural under the circumstances that you're going to be judged and evaluated for when we expose ourselves publicly, there is reward mm -hmm. and or punishment meaning mm -hmm. I may be humiliated or I may win here. So there's an anxiety factor here. This is called a high right. stakes situation. This is a low stakes situation. So I can master my guitar in my low stakes situation, but I haven't tested it in my high stakes situation. And so exactly. even with all of that practice in the world, I still must learn a secondary skill, which is the, mm -hmm. the ability to experience my anxiety and mm -hmm. thrive in that environment to maintain my train of thought while I am very frightened, you see. Exactly. And yeah. Yeah. what people often don't anticipate is what we call stuttering is, hey, why do I speak smoothly when I'm talking right. to my cat? And why, when I order pizza, am I going berserk? Now, exactly. if an individual is unaware of the fact that there is a social component, which is perfectly normal and must be faced, we may, may be unaware of the fact that to learn the guitar is a skill during low stakes situations. Mm -hmm. And to be able to play the guitar under high stakes situations is a totally different skill. So bring mm -hmm. us some hope. We don't have to uh, we're not we don't have to be 100% here. Just give us some hope, Michael, which is tell us about speaking as a skill under high stakes situations and mm -hmm. why often people are unaware that it's not automatic that you should just master Right. Picking up the phone and ordering a pizza, not experiencing anxiety with so tell us, share yeah. your experience on this. Well, I mentioned the word earlier, desensitization, right? So that's an important word just to keep in the back of our minds. Uh, yeah, you mentioned another very important word, judgment. Like this is huge uh, for people who stutter, stammer, uh, and for basically anyone who's going to be judged in an interview or they're in a meeting. I've talked to people who, when they're speaking with their colleagues, they speak relatively well. As soon as a person, an authority comes in the room, all of a sudden they start stuttering, right? So, so yes, this does have to do with judgment. How do we fix this? Well, all of the, the practices that, that one goes through in Pro 90D, there are affirmations, there's visualization, something that we call verbalization, there's self-talk. Learning to talk to yourself raises your awareness of what's going on in the moment and what you're thinking and talking about. So sometimes people will, before they get into that interview, 
they're already thinking about failing. They're already thinking they're going to stutter. They're going to block, right? So this is before they open their mouth. They haven't stuttered yet, but they're thinking about it. They know they're going to do it. So we know that there's a psychological component to this because they haven't even opened their mouth. So we have to change our thought patterns, the way that we think, what we say to ourselves, our self-talk. And if we can change that, well, the next thing we have to do is in the midst of the conversation or the interview or presentation, you have to be able to talk to yourself and remind yourself to do certain things. Because if you don't, if you're not aware of what you're thinking and what you're doing and you don't consciously try to change that, your brain will default to whatever it usually does. And that's why you can practice by yourself. You can go to speech therapy. You can do programs, watch videos, do affirmations. But as soon as you get in a high stakes situation, it all goes out the window because you haven't trained yourself to be aware of what you're thinking and doing in the moment, right? Kind of desensitizing, changing the direction of what you do. So here's something that I do with my clients. I say, thinking about your speech, the way that you speak, when you're speaking is abnormal. We don't usually do that, right? We just, it's automatic, it's just like walking. But I'm going to ask you to do something that's abnormal because you're gonna have to do it for a period of time until you develop this new way of speaking and thinking. So what I want you to do is to focus 80% of your attention on how you're speaking and trust that you will say what you want to say. The other 20% can go back and forth between what you're trying to say. And I watched the guy do this just the other day. I said, okay, he was speaking choppy. And I said, focus 80% of your attention on extending and blending your words, extending and blending. And trust that you're going to be able to tell me whatever you want to tell. And as soon as he did that, it was like magic. Right. So this is not normal, but he focused his attention on how he was speaking and he spoke perfectly smoothly. Now, if he keeps doing that over and over again in all different kinds of speaking situations, well, guess what? The brain doesn't want to expend energy thinking about how you speak. So it wants to automate it. It wants to turn it wants to turn this new way of speaking into a habit. So the more you focus on how you're speaking, that is speaking smoothly, not just thinking about how you're speaking, but speaking smoothly, the more you focus on it, the more those neurons that are managing that kind of speech fire together. And the more they fire together, Hebb's law, the more they'll wire together. And when they wire together and they myelinate, right, they insulate, it becomes a habit. And so you Stop thinking about the way that you speak, even in high stakes situations. This happens with athletes, public speakers, musicians, everyone. That's the way it works. So it becomes, if I'm, if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly, is you're saying that with enough repetition, it becomes automatic. It moves into the bones. So just like the stutterer who attempts to speak, and displays a radical secondary. Mm -hmm. One can propose that that secondary became in the bones, mm -hmm. automatic. Exactly. Right. On the same, using the same technology of entrainment, mm -hmm. of an individual can train themselves out of, ask the question, is that required? Is that part of my communication set or perhaps the best guess of an eight-year-old child, which is set in my bones? And if that's the case, can I, can I with focus and attention, mm -hmm. be aware of that tendency, that anticipation, mm -hmm. and choose something else? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So let me ask you this. In my observation of learning any new skill, there are three components. One, the what to do, which is the skill. Number two, self-love. We haven't spoken much about that yet. And number three, the social arena, stage fright, public speaking, facing the mob. So facing the mob is a skill, number three. Self-love is a skill, and the what to do or how to do it is a skill. 
Let's talk a little bit about self-love. Many people who are experiencing tremendous anxiety have exposed to me that their entire internal dialogue is quite nightmarish. They will mm -hmm. say things like, you idiot, you moron, you jerk, you blew it again. There you go. And they whip themselves into submission and they beat themselves beautifully. So the question would be, um, how important is self-love, self-acceptance, self-kindness, patience mm -hmm. and forgiveness with the self and in developing a kind and positive internal dialogue shall we hear demons in our head or shall we hear angels in our head and is there anything we can do about it what are your thoughts yeah that's a great question i'm glad that you asked that uh, so many people that i've worked with have said that oh i beat myself up I, I, that's exactly what they say. i beat myself up all the time or i used to beat myself up and a part of our program is changing that inner dialogue right changing what you're thinking and what you're saying to yourself it's also accepting the fact that uh, you're going to hit what I call bumps in the road, right? So it's something I call the confident speaker's mindset. And you, you learn to have more of a, a flexible mindset as opposed to rigid. Okay, I got to say it this way. I got to speak perfectly. I can't stutter. If I do stutter, then, right? So it's changing the person's mindset. Uh, being more acceptance, accepting of the fact that, hey, I'm going to have bumps in the road. I'm going to struggle with my speech sometimes, and that's okay, but here's what I'm doing about it. Um, not allowing themselves, I call these trains of thinking, beating themselves up, right? Saying negative things, thinking negatively is a train of thinking. What do we have to do? Well, you have to understand that you're on this train. It's taking you someplace you don't want to go. Now you need to jump off that train and get on a new one, right? And so by, by doing that, you stop beating yourself up and you start encouraging yourself. You start talking to yourself in a more encouraging way, saying more constructive things. I also have an expression that I learned. You rig the game in your favor. You always rig the game in your favor where you always win. So many people put up their own roadblocks, right? You say, oh, uh, I got to do it this way. I can't do it this way. And, and they're putting up their own roadblocks. So always rig the game in your favor, meaning you do whatever you need to do so that you can speak smoothly. And I don't want to get off on this track too far, but I just want to give you a little example. One of our strategies is to have you think about your speech like water. Right? Think about your speech like water. And if you look at water in an ocean and it comes upon a, 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 a cruise liner, it doesn't just stop and go, Arr! OK, I, I can't go anywhere. I can't go anywhere. No, it goes around. It goes over. It goes under. Right? It keeps moving. So one of our strategies is uh, using transition words, using introductory words. And as a, as, as a last option, switching a word if you need to. If you need to, as a last option, we want you to be able to say what you want and you will. But as a last option, you may need to switch that word out. Why? To keep the flow going. And the reason this is important and it's relevant to your question is you're rigging the game in your favor so that you can continue to speak smoothly. Because the more you experience yourself speaking smoothly, the more you'll continue to speak smoothly. And if that means using an and or a transition word or switching a word every now and then so that you can speak smoothly then that's what you need to do. Don't put obstacles in your own way, which is not a reflection of self-love or self-care, right? And you just, no, nope, I can't do it. This is why I've always done it this way. So this is one of the ways we teach people to really to love and be more accepting. Now, self-acceptance doesn't mean accepting yourself as a stutterer, right? I can accept myself and I can still say, guess what? I'm going to demand more of myself. I believe that I can become an excellent speaker, even though right now I stutter or I block or whatever it is. So we can accept ourselves as we are and at the same time uh, focus on the changes that we'd like to make. So 
that's all that I'll say about that. I hope I kind of addressed your question. <laughs> you you did. I guess maybe just to just to clarify, I just want to zoom right in very specifically. Please. Yeah, the yeah. topic of negative self-talk. If my mm -hmm. internal dialogue is highly negative, which is in my bones because I train myself without thinking about it, without choosing for myself, I automatically go into, you idiot, you moron. Uh, exactly. What's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with the other thing? If right. negative self-talk breeds anxiety, can you give us some examples of how you might deal with someone's negative, the habituated negative internal dialogue to get them to flip that and start getting on their side uh, with perhaps affirmations or what technologies do you use to get someone to hopefully begin being a, uh, a positive self-talk person, uh, a self-loving and on their, become loving and on their side, get the monkey off their back of their own mm -hmm. self-criticism. Um, give mm -hmm. us some examples of, of uh, affirmations or internal dialogue mm -hmm. exercises. What do you do to help, help us break this habit? Good. A uh, couple things come to mind. In our daily blueprint of activities, daily routine, one of the first things that we have people do is select three affirmations that they're going to memorize. And every morning as they're waking up or before they leave their bathroom, we want to anchor this habit of saying affirmations to something that they always do. You're always going to wake up. You're always going to go to the bathroom unless you die. Right. You're going to do. So we anchor it to a specific time. You, you select at least three affirmations. And I'll tell you what some of them are. And you can use I or you can use you. Some We found that using you when you're talking to yourself feels more authoritative, but you can also use I. So we have a series of affirmations. Some of them are, I'm an excellent speaker. I'm an amazing speaker. People love to speak with me. People love hearing me speak. I'm a genius at speaking, right? And what's going to happen is when you start saying these to yourself, your brain's going to resist it. It's going to reject. It's, it's going to kick it out and say, that's not true. That's not true. Right. And that when you feel that resistance, that's a good thing, because that means you're trying to change your thinking pattern, your beliefs about yourself. So you say these affirmations and all of a sudden your brain starts to accept it and the resistance gets less and less. So we have a series of affirmations that person does every morning and in the evening. So we say you must do them in the morning. You should do them in the evening and you can sprinkle them throughout your day, right? That's one thing, affirmations, self-talk. Self-talk can be affirmations or it can be anything you need to say to yourself to keep yourself encouraged. So during the day, you tell yourself, wow, you did a great job then. You know what? Yeah, you, you got a little stuck there, but you spoke well over here. You got stuck where you used to get stuck. Notice I'm saying, I'm not saying stuttering and blocking, we're changing our terminology, right? We're changing the words we use. We're gonna, you used to get stuck for 10 minutes, the whole 10 minutes. But this time you only got stuck for eight, but you spoke well for two minutes, right? So that's like the glass half full, half empty. So you start talking to yourself, encouraging yourself. Say, hey, listen, just relax. Take your time. You don't have to rush. You don't have to. It doesn't matter what they think or say. Just take your time. These are, this is self-talk. So different than affirmations, right? Affirmations are just a structured statements that you make, but they're still affirmational. They're affirmational. They're encouraging. And you talk to yourself throughout the day. What are we doing? Well, you're replacing what you usually do, which is just let that train of negative thinking just take you away. Oh, shoot. I did it again. I went, right. So we have self-talk affirmations. We have I could say visualization, but let's just talk about verbalization. This is a new technique that I kind of developed. And this is where you take a situation like an interview and you describe it as though it's happened already. Right. And or you can describe it as though it's happening now in the way that you want. And the reason that it's a little different is because it combines visualization. It combines self-talk and affirmations. So you might say, wow, I had an interview today and I was very relaxed and I was, I was just a little anxious. I was a little nervous at first, but I was able to relax myself out. 
I was able to articulate all of my thoughts smoothly and clearly. The interviewer was nodding and smiling. Oh my God, I felt great. This was a wonderful interview and went super well. That's a verbalization. You're saying it, you're describing it in detail. You're using positive words, constructive words. So as you start to speak it, you're also hearing it. You're also starting to visualize it and you also start to feel it. So it's a more powerful form of uh, visualization and self-talk. So those are three of the tools that we use to help people replace their current patterns of negative thought beating themselves up. Excellent. Uh, another question, how important, sounds to me what you're describing also is acknowledging our wins. We must acknowledge our wins in order to ensure our forward movement. Why would acknowledging our wins help ensure our forward movement and staying on the path to our success? Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about acknowledging our wins? It kind of goes back to your earlier question, like the, the negative self-talk, beating ourselves up, self-love, right? Uh, often we don't see the traction that we're gaining. We don't see our successes. We don't acknowledge them and we don't celebrate them. We only see the fact that we're still struggling. And so that's discouraging. It pulls us back. It causes us to lose traction and slide back and say, oh, see, I knew this wouldn't work. This is not working, right? We also have the placebo effect where it worked for a while and then all of a sudden it seemingly stops working. So then you get discouraged. So it's very important to acknowledge, I say, set your expectations to one. That means look for very, very small incremental improvements. Don't expect large improvements. Don't expect them fast. You may get them, but look for very, very, very small incremental improvements and celebrate them because they'll give you traction. They'll keep you encouraged. And this goes against what we normally do. So that's why we have to be aware but hey, this isn't something I would usually do. I need to start looking for, because if you look for it, you will filter in your successes as opposed to filtering in your failures. Right? You look for your successes no matter how minute they are, and you celebrate it. And the next thing you know, you're getting more success. You're getting more traction. And, and that traction, the law of accelerating acceleration, it actually starts to grow and it starts accelerating faster and faster. Right. So you got to look for filter in the successes, no matter how small they are, and celebrate them. Some people actually diary diary them. Right. They write them down and that they can go back and look and see all of the successes that they actually had, as opposed to allowing ourselves to think about, oh, I'm still getting I'm still blocking. I'm still having this problem. That's not going to help <laughs> at all. Excellent. Uh, another crucial question is because there are a handful of speech pathologists out there that are presenting this idea this notion which i find ridiculous which is speaking is uh, an automated affair speaking is not a skill um, mm. in my opinion this is absolute nonsense it's not based on science or vocal law uh, ask the shakespearean speaker if his speech is beautiful because of luck or because of an undying level of focus and mastery moment mm -hmm. to moment to moment that is a skill exactly. uh the singer hitting the high note roll turning the phrase just perfectly which requires tremendous amount of focus moment to moment and this is the this is an indication of a skill uh uh, if we talk about, um, so I have heard stutterers say, you know what? Speaking shouldn't be a skill. It should just be something that I let go and let God. If you tell, give me an idea of how to speak smoothly. And you may say, uh, are you sure? Are you trying to voice that voiceless consonant? Or are you on the vowel right now in that phrase? I, that should be enough for me. I shouldn't have to 
at the moment of standing at the podium before 500 people be focused on presentation like it's a skill game i should be able to just let go and let god and just and because that would be natural that's the mm -hmm. natural state so can you shed some light on the difference between mastery and whatever and mm -hmm. Give stutterers an understanding of if you are so horrible at a particular activity mm -hmm. um, uh, that it may require a tremendous amount of skill for you for a variety of different reasons or focus mm -hmm. at the moment mm -hmm. as opposed to letting go. Tell us a little bit about focus yeah. uh, and so on and so forth. Yep. So a person who struggles with their speech, sometimes they feel like, well, why why is this happening to me? Why do I have to focus so much on my speech? Or why do I have to go through this process so that I can speak well? I should just be able to speak well, smoothly, just like everyone else. I say, well, you can't, right? now. Yeah. This is what you need to do. Right? <laughs> if you're struggling with your speech, this is what you need to do. So it doesn't matter what other people are doing. And you want to look at this as a blessing in disguise, as a package that's getting unwrapped and that you are now because you have to work on your speech are not just going to get back to a basic level of being able to communicate well you're actually going to become a master because you're we are teaching you the same skills that master communicators use that people who speak very well you're learning the same thing you're going to actually in fact your speech is becoming a superpower i call it a superpower because of this and they experience that right so you go through the different phases where you have to raise your level of consciousness we've said this already right you raise your level of consciousness awareness of how you're speaking and you focus on the skills that you want to develop, whatever those skills are, inflecting, whatever, extending, whatever it is, breathing, right? Rem remembering to breathe. Some people forget to breathe. So you focus on those things for a period of time. It's like any other skill. And you're, you're relearning how to speak well. So let's just say you have a basketball player and he wants to change uh, some aspect of his game. Well, guess what? He's going to get worse before he gets better. Why? Because he has automated how he shoots the free, for, for, free throw. He's automated it. Now he has to bring back into consciousness the mechanics that he's using so that he can change them and improve them. So he's going to get worse, but then he's going to get better because he's going to kind of re-automate the new set of skills, the new mechanics. Same thing. You learned to speak a certain way or you spoke a certain way and that included stuttering or whatever. Now you're going to bring back into awareness how you're speaking. And now we're going to train you to speak differently and think differently. And if you do that consistently over a period of time, your brain automates it. Right. And so you don't have to think about it any longer. If you immerse yourself in the process, if you do it consistently over a period of time, it just becomes natural. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll never have these fluencies or that you won't be aware of them, because you may. Just like me, I still have these fluencies from time to time, but I don't have to think about the mechanics of speaking right now. Right? I just don't have to do it. Sometimes I'll have this fluency and I have to, OK, slow down or do this or do that. So what I tell people, I'll take a small percentage of this fluency is because now my speech is an asset. It's a superpower. It allows me to be a blessing to other people. So I'll take the little bit of disfluencies that I have because I've developed, I've taken that disfluency, the stuttering, and turned it, transformed it from a liability to one of my greatest assets. So I'll take it. I'll take it any day. I love it. Fantastic. And my final question for you is this is for people's success. I desire for them to be successful. And so the last component, we talked about we spoke about the what to do or how to do it. We spoke about self-love and we spoke about the high stakes social environment, which logically we can be punished if we say something stupid, if we mm -hmm. screw up our performance or whatever. So there's fear there. So 
to be able to feel the fear and do it anyway, to be able to mm -hmm. have the anxiety and mm -hmm. move forward with the anxiety in place. That's not to say that by using certain techniques that the anxiety will start to drop, but mm -hmm. the, I may have to begin while I'm experiencing a nervousness or an anxiety mm -hmm. state, okay? Yeah. So there are many stutterers out there who say this, and I want to talk about the the importance of facing fear. Mm -hmm. I've heard this before. Facing my fears, how important that could that be? I know it's very important, but I'll tell you what. When I the mo when when I tell you what, I'm going to proceed. I'm going to make that phone call after I've lowered my anxiety. I'm going to get in front of the crowd of people at at uh, at the speaking group after I've mastered lowering my anxiety so I can walk out there just peacefully and calmly <laughs> and make my presentation. I love your laughter. Please uh, elaborate. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> my program and probably any other program is pretty much not going to work if you wait <laughs> until, until you've lowered your anxiety and you, you're no longer afraid of this system. Is this not going to work? Um, I'll give you an example of something that happened to me, and it's something that I tell my clients about what to do when you're feeling nervous or you're feeling anxious. And I say the same thing that you just said, that you got to go out in the midst of it. So uh, something that happened to me, and then I'll talk about why avoidance is the worst thing that you can do. So several years ago, I was in a coaching group. And we had to travel from where I live on the East Coast over the West Coast. And there were opportunities to get up on stage and share something, to do a little workshop. And at the time, I was a full-time speech coach, but I was working from home. So, you know, for decades, I had been out there teaching, uh, doing works. I was a relationship coach, was preaching, whatever it was. I was doing that. I was out there. And when I moved inside and I just started coaching, I wasn't doing that anymore. I still loved it, just wasn't doing it as much. So I would take advantage of these opportunities to get up on stage in front of hundreds of people and share whatever. And I would also teach a little workshop amongst our group. Now, remember, when I did the workshop, I was, I was pretty relaxed, right? I was pretty relaxed, pretty confident because I'm a speech coach. But when I got up on stage in front of hundreds of people, my heart felt like it was going to jump out of my shirt. And I, I wanted to do this. I loved doing it, but I still felt anxious. I still felt nervous. So what did I do? Now, here I am, speech coach, done thousands of presentations, anxious as hell, right? What did I do? I breathed, 777s seven, seven, or whatever, just I breathe. I continue to breathe to give my brain oxygen to relax. Slowly, my heart started to slow down a little bit. When I got up on the mic, I started and spoke super slow. I remembered to breathe and I spoke super slow. And I eventually sped up a little bit. My heart rate went down and I felt more relaxed. So what did I do? Well, there were a few things that I had control over. I had control over my breathing. I had control over the, my, the rate of speech, like how quickly I was, I had control over my body movements. So I moved, right? I took my time. I had control over what I was thinking. So I did that. And people literally came up to me. They didn't, they, they didn't have to. They came up and said, man, even though you spoke slowly, oh my God, you, you just held our attention. You spoke so well. And multiple people did that. So the point is, you can speak well, not just speak not just not lose control but you can actually speak very well even though you feel anxious there are just certain things that you need to do in order to perform well in the face of pressure so that's a real life example from me of how you can do that and then finally i'll just say that avoidance is the worst thing that you can do you have to get out there and you have to face your fears and you have to get out and speak to people, different kinds of people, different high stakes, low stakes. But the difference is you want to go out equipped with the tools and the practice. So you don't just keep going out there 
doing the same thing, having the same negative experiences, right? You go out there with your <laughs> tools and you learn yeah. to use the tool when you're actually in the situation because you can you can use you can practice using the tool at home, but when you go out there, all of a sudden it doesn't work. Well, that's normal, but you still have to do it because if you don't, it won't work. Your fears will grow. Excellent. We'll be wrapping up here very quickly. You've been so generous of your yeah. time. Just a couple of other questions. What sure, sure. is the number one reason you found as to why people struggle with their speech and what's been the best solution? Yeah, that's that's an easy one. <laughs> the num and this isn't for everyone, but it's just it's the number one reason that I found. It is speed. I said speed kills speed kills in driving and in speech. So the number one thing has been people either speaking too fast because it's it's a habit or it's cultural or whatever, or, or they're feeling rushed. Maybe they're not speaking that fast, but they feel rushed. And so therefore they become anxious, become cloudy, they start stuttering, stammering, and so forth. So the number one solution has been helping them to learn to slow down and take their time. Doesn't mean speak super slow the whole time. No, we're not saying that. Like dragging your work, we're not, that's not what we teach. But it's teaching them how to slow down. Now, it's easy to tell someone to slow down, but Pro90D gives you the tools and there are a variety of them to actually help you slow your speech down and feel more relaxed and calm. All right, so we show you how to do it. There's lots of different ways and they're very effective ways. So that's the number one issue, speaking too fast and or feeling rushed. And the number one solution is learning to slow down. Take your time. Why are large number, a large number of your students and coaching clients, doctors and engineers? Great question. They have told me it's because they're attracted to the scientific basis of Pro90D. Again, I will say that I'm not a, a scientist, um, but they're attracted to the science and to the systematic holistic approach. So it's not just uh, focusing and working on the speech, the physiology of speech, but we also address the psychology. So they like the holisticness of it. But they also like the fact that it's a system. So engineers, scientists, doctors like systematic approaches, right? And they like the science. The, I mean, I had doctors who are very, very much aware of how the, the neurology of this whole thing works, right? They're aware of neuroplasticity. They know how the brain works. And so they like that. And that's why I attract a lot of professionals like doctors scientists, engineers, and people like that, and, and all kinds of other people, but they're very attracted to that aspect of Pro90D. Pro can you tell us more about Pro90D? Can you tell us a little about, can you break it into componentry and uh, the elements of it? And uh, uh, how does a person move through Pro90D? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, You've heard me allude to a lot of this earlier, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to make this brief. Pro90D addresses really three aspects of our speech. Number one, the physical side, that is the breathing and vo voice inflection and what some people might call elongating, but I call it extending your words for dynamic speech and control. It's not just extending all your. So we work on the physical side of speaking to help you to speak well, not just not stutter, but to speak well, so that when you speak, people listen and they love to hear you speak, physical. We also work on the mental or the psychological, the mindset, how you think. We've already said that people anticipate, so before they open their mouth, they're already thinking they're gonna, so we know there's a psychological component for most people to stuttering. So we work on that, we help you replace, replace, your thinking patterns, how you think about your speech, how you think about your speaking situations. And then the third component is one that you don't hear a lot about, your speaking identity. 
we help you change how you see yourself as a speaker and your beliefs about yourself as a speaker. So we can work the other two. You can actually, there's lots of programs that work the other two. But if you don't change your identity, you'll get sucked back into being a stutterer and stuttering. So that just, if you have a disfluency <clears throat> and you think that you're a stutterer and you're just using a bunch of techniques, then you'll say, oh, I'm stuttering again. I'm, I'm still I'm still a stutterer. But if you change your identity and you see yourself as an excellent speaker and you stutter, it's like a bump in the road. It's just like, okay, I just had a little disfluency. So what? I had a student tell me that he has a friend who speaks worse than him, stutters all the time, but it doesn't see himself as, so it doesn't bother him. So it, all, it comes down to identity. So Pro90D addresses those three aspects. When you join Pro90D, there's two ways. You can do the self-study or you can work with me one-on-one. Self-study is a great place to start. Often people need <clears throat> accountability. They need evaluation and feedback. Coaching is the fastest, easiest way to get to smooth speech. The self-study, though, is a great way. Everything is there, and so you can do that. Inside the self-study, there is a daily blueprint, which we talked about, and there are eight activities that you must do every day, and these activities include and address those three aspects that we talked about earlier, changing how you speak, changing how you think, and changing your identity are all built into those eight activities. A big, a major foundation of Pro90D is something that we call modeling. So you'll hear me talk about modeling, you'll see modeling, it's a part of the practice that you do. And that in a nutshell is Pro90D. Fantastic. Um, tell us a little bit more about your online courses and how can we find them? Uh, and uh, I heard about a special code that you have, so. Yeah, Tell us more. so you know what? I bet you I put that code together and I don't have it. Is, is I have it. I will, I will, I have it. You so, uh, okay. anyway, Good. I already gave it to you. All right. it is, so, so tell us about it and then I'll provide so, the code that you provided. Good, 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 good. So, yeah, basically, you can just go to uh, www.propro90d.com. That's kind of the starting place. And you go there and you, you'll have an option to choose self-study or coaching, right? And you have a special code, I think, for the self-study. And so those are basically the two ways. We just came out with a new coaching program. It's kind of a, a miniature version. It's for it's five, six 15-minute sessions. So they're like lightning, <laughs> lightning coaching sessions, but it's half the price of what we charge for our other six session coach. And you'll see that on the website as well. If I commit to you now, mm -hmm. uh, people, if I, I really want to share this with you, it's really important. This is a skill, not a pill. What Michael is presenting is a skill. Uh, you must think like an Olympic champion. If you want to be a, a great, you know, or an Olympic. Yeah. If you want to do the 90 yard dash, you got to do it, do it, do it and get better and ask what else can I give? What else can I give? What else can I give? You must invest of your, all of your psyche, your mind, commit to your success full, uh, fully. Uh, if you just are glancing at something and skimming at it, uh, you're going to get what you give. You're going to get what you invest into it. So Michael, if I'm an individual, who's absolutely motivated and I'm absolutely mm -hmm. committed and I follow your guidelines. Mm -hmm. What kind of, obviously it's not, uh, it's, there's no guarantees here in life, but if golf is a skill game, singing is a skill game, driving a car is a skill game and speech is a skill game. Um, what kind of, what kind of successes have you seen in what kind, what amount of time um, mm -hmm. for people who really commit to your, yeah your training and methodologies what what have you seen what kind of changes and how quickly so the reason it's called pro 90d is because we, we we work with you and you can expect to see certain kinds of results within 90 days but that's not the end of it nor is it the beginning right it's just so not, it doesn't start in 90 days it doesn't end in 90 days um, some studies have been done that show that Habit formation can take anywhere from 18 days to about 250 some days or so. So about eight months, eight and a half months, right? It can take, it can be shorter and it can be longer, 
This, these are just what the studies show. These studies jive with my own experience. They're very consistent with my own experience. So what you, so what I found is if a person immerses themselves kind of like you, you can wade into the water, but at some point you have to get all the way in and you can jump in or you can wade in. If you wade in, it'll take a little longer for you to be immersed. If you jump in, you're going to be immediately immersed. So it's up to you. You can do it either way. But if you kind of wade in relatively quickly with within the first three weeks, you're going to see probably an 80 percent improvement in your speech, depending on where you're starting from. If you're, if you're stutterer, you're going to see like a huge improvement within the first three weeks. Some of that you can account for the placebo effect. And so you might go, you might see a boost in one week. Wow, oh my God, I'm not thinking about it. I'm speaking well. And then it drops off. And you go, oh, okay. But then you lean into it. And within a couple of weeks, you come back out higher within a few weeks. Then within about six to eight weeks, your improvements become more consistent, right? So around eight weeks, it starts to become it starts to become automatic. It's not automatic yet, but it starts. You can start. People will say, oh, you know what? I was just speaking smoothly with this person and I didn't even know it. I didn't even feel like it. Right? So it starts. And then within about 12 weeks, again, it's more automatic. And then you go on to about six months and seven and eight months. And it just keeps becoming more and more automated. Speaking is a skill. So you can't just do the program and stop. That's why I've always positioned myself in jobs and opportunities where I speak. Because, right, if I stop speaking, I might slip back because it's a skill that, that I like doing and that I want to keep up and I want to get better at. So you got to keep that in mind. You can't just go through the program and then just go hide someplace, right? <laughs> so if you commit and if you immerse yourself three weeks, you start, you're like, wow, this is really working. And you may, and you're going to go through some ups and downs. Six to eight weeks, wow, this is, I'm, it's consistent now. Eight to 12 weeks, bam, I can see it. Life is different. Life is very, very different in eight to 12 weeks for you if you immerse yourself. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so uh, I have a gift for those of you who uh, would like to proceed with the online course. Uh, there is a, you will receive with this special code, uh, you'll get a $20 discount off uh, this self-study program, which is 20 off guy. That's 20 O F F G U Y. Uh, Michael, how long is that good for? Is that limited? Uh, how long can this, this video is going to be floating around for a while. So uh, how long is I don't this? Think, yeah. I don't think I put an expiration date on it. So it's, Unlimited. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, what are your plans uh, going forward uh, for mm -hmm. Pro 90D? Well, great question. Uh, right now, I have a coach in training. It's a guy who's, who's been in the system for a while, self-study. We did some coaching together, and he's now observing me and starting to participate in some of my coaching sessions. And he will, you know, um, probably start coaching someone in a a, a couple of months. So I'm starting to train coaches. He lives in another part of the world. Um, it takes a special kind of person and you have to be really committed because people that struggle with this need someone who understands and they're committed, right? They're not going to be not showing up to meetings and so forth. They're not in it for the money. So one thing is we're going to be probably building out our coaching staff. So if that's something that you're interested in, let me know. The other thing is we're going to be I'd say creating a, a slightly different brand for people who don't stutter. Because I have lots of clients who don't stutter, but they struggle to communicate smoothly, clearly, and confidently. And when they come to the website, they're like, oh, this is just for stutterers. Well, no, it's not. It, it's a skill, and it works for everyone. So we'll probably be setting up a page for people to go to um, so that they don't have to feel like, well, this is just for people who stutter. And so it'll be kind of rebranded, if you will, um, Pro 90D for the professional. We also work with children of a certain age if the parents are there. So we might be expanding that a little bit. Um, usually they need to be, I don't know, 10, 11, somewhere around that, eight or 10. So that's what's um, on the horizon for Pro 90D, just kind of expanding a little more 
uh, to, to reach people who can use the Sasava guy that works for Apple right now. Doesn't stutter, loves the program, tremendous benefits from it. So we need to reach more people like that. Fantastic. How can people get in touch with you? What's the best way for people to reach out and get a hold of Michael? The best way is to go to my website, pro90d.com, and there's a little chat bubble. And you hit that chat bubble and leave your email. So you can ask a question. You can leave your email and it comes right into my inbox and I have a little tool. And that's the best way to communicate with me is the chat bubble on my website. Well, I can tell you this has been absolutely inspiring. You are inspiring. Thank you for Thank you. giving people their lives back. I have I received a comment from an individual. This may have been an, uh, <clears throat> a, an accident in his speech, but I found it rather profound. He said to me, Guy, I would like a more fluent life. And that really resonates what you just said, because I believe yeah. that that's what you bring people, a fluent life. Is it about the stutter or is it about our ability to connect with ourselves and to connect with others, to connect with the divine? Is it about connection? And I truly believe that you bring us the gift. You facilitate connection. So thank you for your your hard work and your innovation, your creativity, and your thinking outside the box, and your willingness to invent new methods to, for us, to assist us in connecting with ourselves and with others. And I guess finally, in closing, I'd like to ask you, Michael, is there anything, thank you for being a wonderful, generous guest, uh, anything you'd like to share with us in closing? Yeah, I, would, I just want to, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for, uh, for reaching out to me, right? You connected with me in LinkedIn and you were persistent because you know people people reach out all the time trying to sell you stuff. What's it for? I mean, that's you know, if it's good and it works, then that's what we should do. But thank you for being persistent to make this happen. Um, thank you for your generosity of, of time as well and and for being able to to really get this out on a larger stage, a bigger stage. So so thank you for that. I just want to tell those of you that that may be watching this, there is hope. It, whether it's through me or through Guy or through someone else, there is hope. Uh, speaking, whether you stutter, it doesn't matter why you stutter, where it came from. It is something that you can replace with something better, right? So it doesn't matter why. It doesn't matter how severe. It doesn't matter how many years. It doesn't matter what you've tried before. The fact of the matter is it's a skill. It's a habit, the same with your thinking. You can replace it with new skills and new habits. So there's hope. And I've seen it personally, and I've worked with thousands of people. I've been coaching for a decade now, full time. I've seen everything, and I'm just telling you, you can do it. Wow. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, you are a godsend. Thank you for your generosity as well. And uh, with your permission, I'm going to be checking in on you uh, from time to time. I want to hear about your innovations, your discoveries, and your new breakthroughs. So thank you for this time uh, to, be you. Uh, to be continued, dot, dot, dot. Blessings to you, and thank you all for watching. Please reach out to Michael. He has uh, something amazing to share with you. And he has the ability to help you find your voice and to assist you in connecting at a deeper level with yourself and with others. Much love to you. Much gratitude to you. Thank you so much for your generosity, Michael, and look forward to wow. talking with you again. Same here, Guy. Thank you. Mm -hmm.